So uh, what I want us to do, you'll notice there's a bit of a guide here breaking down different character groupings in the text. We got beasts, we got ancient of days, we got son of man, we got holy people of the most high. And I've, I think, is the passage in color? It should be in color. Um, so it's, it should be color coordinated. So there's like orange and pink and blue and, and yellow. So that's my attempt to help you locate these different character groupings as quickly as possible as you read through it. And so this is how we're going to do it for the first little bit. We're going to do a bit of a Bible study because this is a bit of a crazy passage. And um, if we don't actually look at what the text is saying, we're going to get it wrong. I guarantee it. Like we will just like go off the rails and we'll just start making stuff up. That stuff might be very interesting and maybe later Marvel will make it a movie. But it's bad Bible study. Okay, so today we're going to try to do good Bible study. Look at what the text is actually saying. And then from there... Um, maybe some find some wisdom along the way. So what I'm going to ask you to do is read through it, but what you're going to try to do at first is just locate the beasts in the Ancient of Days. Take a few minutes and just observe the text. What is the text saying about the beasts? And what is the text saying about the Ancient of Days? All right, and so go ahead and get a pen or whatever you need. Write that stuff down in those categories. And just what is the text actually saying about those categories of of characters in the text okay is that cool awesome the the text is uh you, you're probably going to need the actual printout but it's daniel 7 the whole thing they ran out awesome this was a great day to do that <laughs> good luck with that. all right daniel 7 try to find the beasts in the ancient of days and observe what is it actually saying about those those categories of characters Now it's a lot. I'll give you another minute focusing on the beasts in the Ancient of Days.
All right, go ahead and turn to your neighbor. You may not got all of it. It's okay. We're going to spend some more time in the text. Turn to your neighbor. Turn to like a little small group and talk about it. What is this text saying about the, the orange and the pink, the, the four beasts in the Ancient of Days? What is the text actually saying? Turn to your neighbor. I'm just going to give you like a minute of doing this. So go ahead and, and get in it. All right, just make a few more observations, then we're going to jump into the rest of the text. Just a few more observations. Don't worry, we'll do this cycle a couple times with this text. Okay, I know there's a lot here. We're, we're going to get back to it. I do want to point out a few things. If you'll notice in the side comments, the anti-Eden imagery in this text, that out of a sea of chaos, out of the waters of chaos, comes these unkosher beasts, these mixing of land animals, sea animals, um, and, and air animals. That is biblically unkosher. You do not mix types of animals. You know, there's the evolution of evil. And this imagery of like, God is saying mankind should rule over the animals, but humans have submitted to the animals and have become animal-like. And so there's this total like inversion, anti-Eden, anti-creation. And instead of bearing life, these animals, these beasts, create chaos in the world. They trample, devour, destroy. So that's got to be in our mind. Like that's totally what Daniel's doing here. He's totally hearkening back to Genesis 1, 2, and 3 and saying, man, like these beasts, these human endeavors, they're the way of the serpent. They're the way, they, like it's humans having submitted, instead of ruling over animals, having submitted to animals and becoming beasts themselves. And what they produce is not Eden. They produce the anti-creation, the anti-Eden. And it kills, that devours, destroys, tramples. So that's got to be in our mind as we read the rest of this text. So go ahead. The, let's do the blues and the yellows, the Son of Man and the Holy People of the Most High. So read through the text again, focusing on those two character categories. Read through that text. What is the text actually saying about the Son of Man? And what's the text saying about the Holy People of the Most High?
Once you read through it, go ahead and get in your groups again. What are you seeing? What's the text actually saying about the Son of Man and the holy people of the Most High? So once you read through it, go ahead and turn to a group and uh, start unpacking that, those characters. Okay, let's bring it together. Bring it together for a few minutes. So what we have here are these anti-creation, anti-Eden beasts, these humans, these kings and kingdoms that arise out of the sea chaos. This is the imagery here. It's all Genesis kind of stuff, but it's the anti-version. What do they do? They trample, they kill, they destroy. They imitate humans, but they are not human. And they become animal-like. They become beastly. And throughout the whole Old Testament, there is this cosmic battle between the offspring of the serpent, baby snakes, and the offspring of Eve. In every passage after that, you'll notice the difference between Cain and Abel. Abel's one who's basically a child of Eve. Cain succumbs to the temptation to murder. And the way the, murder, the temptation to murder is described is it is crouching at your door ready to consume you, ready to pounce on you. This is their, kind of the original language. It's described as animal-like, and Cain 
succumbs to the animal, and he becomes an offspring of the serpent. So there's the serpents and the offspring, and then, and then all of a sudden you see, the, you see Ham, and you see Nimrod, and Nimrod builds Assyria, builds Babylon. You see the Tower of Babel. This is all in Genesis. And so Daniel's importing that and saying, that all has significance here. And there's this cosmic war between the, the, the sons of the serpent and the sons of Eve. And there's going to be one like the son of man, a human, that's going to crush the serpent. So the whole time in the Old Testament, there's like, is this the one? It's Noah, Noah. And Noah's like doing the new Eden, right? Because he's got the ark, he's got the animals, and he's at peace with the animals. He has a peace of creation, right? And, he, and he's coming out of this, the waters of chaos, right? The God is like saving him from the waters of chaos. And you're thinking, you're thinking, he's the one. And then he gets drunk. And he's not the one. Dang it. And you think Moses, you think Moses is the one. You know, he, he starts shining. You know, he's like a giant light bulb. He is a Christmas tree himself. And he's walking around. He goes to the cosmic mountain of Sinai. He gets the law. He's a friend of God. And then he doesn't trust the Lord with some water. And he's not the one. He's not the one. David isn't the one. Abraham's not the one. Jacob's not the one. Who will save us? Who is the Son of Man? And so when Jesus comes on the scene, he doesn't call himself Christ or Messiah. He says he's the son of man. So every time you see Jesus, he sees himself as Daniel 7, the one true human who will be exalted with the Ancient of Days, sit on a throne and judge and have a kingdom that will never end and will rule in the way the humans were meant to rule. But we failed. We became serpent-like. This is the cosmic war that Daniel's talking about here. He's using a lot of cosmic language. You know, this is apocalyptic stuff. So that's why it, we have to import a lot of biblical text. And we, don't, we just don't have enough time to do that. If you're interested in more, the Bible Project has a series podcast. And it's called the Son of Man series. It's a seven-part series. Blow your mind. Like your face will melt off. It's awesome. Really, really, really cool podcast. So this is what's going on in, in Daniel. There's cosmic realities. There's the Eden ideal being restored to the Son of Man. There's the anti-Eden coming through humans who try to rule and have authority, but they act like the sons of the serpent. They act like beasts, and they kill, they trample, they devour, they destroy, and they oppress. And then you see the holy people, these people who are just kind of there for the most part, and they just get knocked around quite a bit by the beast until the end, and we'll get to that later. So I think that's the, that's the intro to the text. There's a lot more. There's a lot more. Um, that's why I kind of gave you kind of a little bit more so that you could yourself go and study the text on your own, and you could go to the Bible Project and kind of get into that. But I, I do think there is a word for us today from Daniel 7, out of this apocalyptic literature. What does that mean for today? And so what I want you to do right now, uh, and, and, and it's just a really quick exercise, pull out your phone, and I need you to go to like Google News. And I need you to find the beasts of today. I just need you to scroll really quick. Where do you see devouring? Where do you see trampling? Where do you see oppression? Where do you see the beasts of our day? I don't even know what's on Google News right now. I just need you to go there really quick and hit scroll. Just hit scroll. Not, not the vocal one, maybe. Find the beasts. They're there. They're alive and well. The beasts, they come and go, but the cycle continues. Every generation, the cycle of the beasts continue. You may want to get off the sports page. If you're on the sports page, that's, that's the first thing that loads. I'm just saying the news, global news. Just go there, U.S. news. You'll find them. You'll find the beasts. And, and some pictures of cats, periodically, which are like beasts. I hate those things. Are the beasts alive and well, yes or no? Is there trampling? Is there devouring? Is there destruction? Is there oppression? Yes or no? 
the cycle of the beasts continues. This isn't just an ancient text. This is a text for today. You go ahead and put your phones down. Don't get sucked in. The cycle of the beast continues, and guys, everybody wants change. We hope for renewal. All the humans, all humans, every religion, every, every persuasion, every country wants something to be different. Knows in our bones like it's not right. Like we, that's why we have politics. That's why like, clubs exist and nonprofits exist. And we know something needs to change. That's why we have New Year's resolutions. You're like, something needs to change here. We know something's not right. We look at the news, and you know, you're like, we need to vote different. Whatever your persuasion is. Whatever your persuasion is. You think it needs to change. We hope for change. Republicans, Democrats, liberals, conservatives, religious priests and atheists alike, we all want a new day. Because in our bones, we know something's wrong. We need to change. We call for change. But as one author said, every revolution just brings other men. It never brings new men. The cycle of the beasts continue. And so we need eschatology. We need the end. We need the Son of Man. We need Daniel 7. And this passage for us is not about dreams and visions. It is a call back to the presence of God, to his way, his dominion, his power, his authority, and away from the power and authority of the beasts. And so there's two competing worldviews in our contemporary day and age, according to Mark Sayers in this book called Reappearing Church, two competing worldviews of what it means to change in our common Western culture. So I drew some pictures here. Hopefully you can see them. We all want change. There's something over here. We need to change it. We need to change it. And so in our secular Western worldview, we think to get to human utopia, to get to pleasure, to get to peace, to get to whatever we think is the best, whatever we think is the best, we need to decrease faith, what is seen as faith, and what we mean by faith are religious restrictions. We think we need to reduce restrictions. And progress equals freedom, individual freedom. So we need to increase individual freedom, and we need to reduce restrictions. This is how we're going to get to utopia, human utopia. This is the secular myth. Um, there's lots of examples of how we, we express this and talk about this and, and justify this myth. There is also a biblical idea that there's things called false idols, false gods, and that as we decrease false idols and increase the presence of Yahweh, we get new heaven and new earth. This is like a biblical path. This is a secular path. And so there are distinct pathways. You can go ahead and show those slides. Maybe this might illustrate those two worldviews a little bit more. The secular one, you got those? The secular one is no one back there. Okay, we'll just continue. The secular path is that you were born innocent. We believe we're born innocent. And you guys, just really quick, a lot of us believe that. Even though you're like, I'm a Christian and I'm a bad person. It's like, but you believe your true self, your inner self, is inherently good. That if you only you could get back to who you really are, it is good. And so the second part of the path is we externalize. We, we blame other things. We blame bad experiences or external identities that were put on us or cultures or traditions that cover up our true inner selves, thus making us unhappy. This is what we believe. Part three to the path, we have to escape. We have to break loose from anything that holds us back, any commitment from our true self. And we are the ones who define who we truly are. So anything that gets in our way is evil, is bad is anti-utopia. We have to redefine everything, get rid of everything, any commitment, any discipline, anything that comes against us and binds us. Our freedom is evil. Our path to happiness is to find our true inner self, and we got to get rid of all this other stuff keeping us from us. Number four, we have to discover ourself, find the missing element through self-expression, and we will find meaning and pleasure. This is the Western secular myth, is it not? All over the place. The other is historically revivals. 
This is the pathway to revival, pathway to new heaven and earth coming. One, divine discontent. The people of God go, we are upset by the state of the world, by the state of the church, by our own lives. We are broken. We are broken. The second, preparation. Coming to the end of ourselves, realizing like, I can't actually do anything. I can't actually save myself. I can't actually make the change. I can't actually become holy. I can't actually make people convert. I can't actually do anything. And there's this preparation battling with your flesh, saying, I can't actually do it. I am weak. Three, contending, crying out to God in desperation. God, would you save us? Would you make up for our lack? Would you be faithful when we are faithless? There's just this crying out from the people of God. Number four, holy patterns are then formed. Desperation rhythms, desperation patterns are formed so that we are holy. And the last one is a remnant is formed. This is how every revival starts. This is how every revival is fueled. There's a remnant, a small group of desperate, radical people that serve God. These are the two competing myths, the secular and the biblical. There are two pathways. And in this passage, Daniel sees a vision that exposes humanity's best attempts at civilization. Assyria, Babylon, Persia, Rome. He exposes them for what they are, beastly, as mutant animals that trample, kill, and devour. Guys, it's our best and brightest. Daniel's saying our best and our brightest. Our best political theory. Our best economic models. Our best attempt at peace and restoration and creating order out of chaos produces anti-Eden, anti-creation, unholy and unclean. Our best plans to bring civilization, justice, economic security, peace, prosperity only brings another beast. And the cycle continues. The secular path is a beastly path. It is unclean, unkosher. It leads people to devour, trample, consume, and oppress. Guys, we are thoroughly living in this pathway in our Western culture. And anxiety is through the roof. Depression is through the roof. Suicide is through the roof. Loneliness is through the roof. It is not creating a utopia. It is devouring the people around us. And even some of us who have been tricked to think we could bring the kingdom of God through uh, our own efforts. And we struggle too. We're lonely and anxious and depressed. And we think, if only I got a new job, made more money, got that new car, got a spouse, got a different spouse, Maybe if I got rid of some of my kids. Amen, parents? Amen. Just me? Okay. If I get the right type of friends, a different president, if we keep the same president, then we'll have happiness, pleasure, freedom, utopia. Even me, guys, I get it. I get it. Even me. Last year, I went through severe depression. I look to change everything about my life. All the externals. Change it, move it, shift it, shape it. Anything to find myself. Anything to bring me back the way I was. You know, you know what I'm talking about? Kind of find your way back. I got to find my way back. I got to find my true self. I got to find, I got I to uncover it. I, I wanted to try anything and everything. And I totally forgot about the Christ of Gethsemane. Who suffers and sweats like blood. In our pursuit to change our lives, we walk the secular paths of the beasts. I mean, just think about all the ways that we pursue ourselves. Think about ourselves. Love ourselves. In our culture, we, we run after new experiences. And we run away from discipline or commitments or promises. We justify unforgiveness, hatred, and we reinforce if someone is not with me, then they are my enemy. And we do not persevere in suffering. And we seek pleasure and comfort. But 
what if that's the wrong path? What if in walking that path we're actually becoming animals? We're submitting to the way of the serpent. And if we're honest, we do not run after God. We doubt that our true selves, our true identity is found hidden in Christ. In his presence. Because his path isn't about us. It's about him. And let's be honest, we don't like that very much. Which one do you have more faith in? More trust in? Daniel 7 calls every generation to make a choice. Will you put your faith in the way of the beasts or in God's presence? Which will you trust? Let's say you do. Let's say you trust God. Let's say you seek his face and it's glorious. Has anyone ever been to like a retreat or something and it's like, it's just glorious. Like, it, it, you know, like you need a veil to, to cover your, the glory of God. Has anybody ever had that kind of experience? Maybe a Jesus encounter. It's like, it's a mountaintop, right? You're just like, you're just like everything belongs to Jesus. I love you. I feel loved. It's, it's awesome, right? I mean, is it awesome? Awesome, right? It's, it's incredible when that happens. Your friendships, it's awesome. But as we know, when you go to the mountaintop, you can't stay there, right? And so at the mountaintop, eventually there's going to be drift. So as we have this moment of renewal, this moment of like clarity, this moment of like, it's a shadow of Eden. It's a moment of Eden for us. Presence of God, wholeness. We actually know that we're loved. We know that we're forgiven. We know that we have a destiny in Christ. And we just don't matter as much anymore. I'm talking about that type of moment. And then there's drift. And we drift two ways, guys. Again, this is Mark Sayers. We have this mountaintop of his presence. But we drift one of two ways. One way is we try to hold on to the mountaintop through legalism. We codify the presence of God and say, if I only, I gotta, I, I gotta, I gotta pray like this. I gotta pray like this. I gotta pray like this. We, we just invent stuff. We say, we, we, this is how you get the presence again. You can't say this. You gotta do this. You gotta attend this. You gotta act this way. You gotta start a microchurch. Whatever it is, we find a way and say, if I do that, then I will have the presence of God. This is just another expression of this. If I do this, I will have utopia. The other way is hedonism, pleasure. We take our freedom in Christ to go, amen, thank you, Jesus. Now I'm going to do whatever I want because I'm free in Christ. Yes. And so you, 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 it, it becomes freedom-centric, and so you become friends with the world, and it's, you're all about being relevant, and, and you're like, ah, those, those Christians that throw out the like, like, uh, secular music and just listen to Christian music, they're dorks. But I'm like a real Christian because like, if I press into my freedom in Christ, like, that's really what it's about. That's really about the presence of God. And so, you know, we just start using whatever language we want. You know, my, my case of that, I think you shouldn't be cussing. I think you should take your language seriously. But I happen to be on this end of the spectrum. If you're over here, you're like, yeah, let's drink. Let's smoke. Let's do whatever we want because we're free in Christ. We're forgiven. Remember, we were at this mountaintop. We're hidden in Christ. We could kind of do whatever we want. And we define ourselves by our freedom. Every movement of renewal is eventually pulled in one of these two ways. Every individual is pulled in one of these two ways. Both are an overextension either of human freedom or holy patterns of living. And they're both based in the flesh. It's what I can do to be holy. It's what I could do to be free. It's both fleshly. It's both about you. This is the book of Galatians. Circumcise yourself, otherwise you're not saved. This is Corinthians. What the frick? <laughs> Who's sleeping with who? <laughs> it's encouraging me to know that the first century church also had these problems. I'm like, oh, good. <laughs> it's not just us crazy people. It's actually all people, humans. Which are you, really quick? Just turn to your neighbor. Be like, yeah, yeah, when I go to the mountaintop, that's cool, but like I slide quickly to one or the other. Which ones are you? Just be honest, really quick. Just lean to your neighbor.
All right, all right. So, ironically, ironically, as we're trying to be in the presence of God, as we're trying to like maintain this mountaintop presence of God, we end up repeating the patterns of the beast. Whether you're a legalist or whether you're just like into the flesh and freedom, you, we end up repeating the beastly patterns. This is the irony. We freely put our hope in us changing the world around us, renewing all things. If only we pray harder, it's religious. If only we become more relevant, it's hedonistic. If only we change the laws or meet more people or engage in social enterprise or garden or study more or become less religious or more religious, then we will be saved and we will have renewal and we will get back to the mountaintop. Both ends are filled with the flesh and what we do. We control our destinies. We look to control the chaotic waters of our lives. We believe and have faith that if only we do blank, fill in the blank, get somebody elected, get somebody impeached. If we share the gospel in this way or in this way, if we pray hard enough, we read the entire Bible, whatever it is, man, we trust ourselves. We trust what we can build to save us. And all we produce is another beast. And it tramples and it devours, and it oppresses every time. If we are going to be the holy people of the Most High, people who inherit the kingdom, we must lose our faith in our ingenuity, our best practices, our techniques, our politics. We must lose faith in ourselves. The human perspective of this passage, I think, is best summarized by the great movie Transformers. Giant mechanized gods come to earth, bringing their cosmic war, and humans are in the middle of it. And they have faith that they could actually make a difference. They're like, yeah, if we shoot this gun or we mobilize the military, uh, then we'll be safe. We'll be saved from these mechanized gods. Um, and so I want to show a short clip. The reality of this passage of our lives, the human perspective, I think is captured by this clip. That's us. That's us right there. Is that not true? Is that not true? <laughs> That's us. That's it. Let's just go to communion. That's right. There are mechanized beasts in this world, man. They come and they go, and we're trampled, devoured, and oppressed, and all we can do is scream about it. That's just about it. We can moan. We can groan. We must lose faith in ourselves. Recycling won't save us. More education won't save us. Clean energy won't save us. Church planting will not save us. It's time we lost our faith in Babylon, in the way of the animal, and become the holy people of the Most High. It's time for us to cry, to scream, to weep, and to ask God to come. Ancient of days, son of man, will you come? Will you come and rescue us? This passage is a call back to his presence, to his way, to his dominion, power, and authority and away from the power and authority of the beasts. Worship team, go ahead and come on up. Even our best versions, we must be saved from. Our best attempts at civilization, our best attempts at finding God, our best attempts at church planning and microchurches, we must be saved from. And who will save us? 
from ourselves. I think it's time to Romans 8 ourselves. Romans 8, go ahead and put up those, that text. It says this, we know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. But hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? But if we hope for what we do not have yet, we wait for it patiently. And in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. When I look at the news, I don't know about you, but I want to groan. It's time to groan. I want to groan, not complain, not just rail against whatever, not just shoot off some mean tweets, but groan. Have you ever heard a human groan? I'm talking about truly groan. I was with my friend Alan. Some of you guys already have heard this, but when his wife had a stroke in the ICU ward, and after a few days, it was evident she was never coming back. She was never coming home. And there was two young children in the home, eight and 11. And he said, Jeremy, will you come over when I tell my kids that their mother's never coming home? I said, yes, because you can't say no. And I go there. I'm doing nothing, just praying. Just and he tells his kids, your mom's not coming home. And I'm telling you, man, the groan that comes out of children, wordless, but it says everything. It says everything. There are no words for what we need to start praying, guys. It's a groan. I want to groan again. I want to groan again. When I see Babylon come against my children, looking to devour them, looking to trample them, I want to groan. When I drive my streets and I see people slumped over, jewel coming out their mouth because they're in the sickness of their addiction, and there's nothing I could do for them. There's not really anything I could do for them. I want to groan. God, come. You come, son of man. I want to groan when I see men that should be, could be strong men of God. And I see them being tangled with lust and tripped up with women who are not their wives. And they're just a shadow of their calling. I want to groan. There's nothing I can do, there's no accountability group. There's no sermon I could preach or Bible study series. All I could do is groan. I want to groan again. For Bible studies to start having power. For people to be hungry for the board of life. Say, God, you have to speak not to my mind, but my heart. To my spirit. God, would you come? Would you take this Bible study and make it something different? Would you make it holy and an altar and a temple? Would you make it Eden? Because when I get involved, God, when I make it something, it's anti-creation. It's anti-Eden. It is beastly. But if you come, God, if you were to come, maybe we could have Eden. God, would you come? Underground, it's time to groan again. In our planning, in our Bible studies, the way we decide to use money and buy cars, we got to start groaning. we got to begin with groaning. God, would you come? Ancient of days, would you come? Who cares about microchurches or the thing called the underground or even reaching lost people? God, would you come? God, would you come? Ancient of days, you must. Your dominion, your power, your ideas, 
You, you. I don't have the right words to save my children, the right ideas to rescue my neighbors. I can't even keep my own heart pure. But maybe I can groan and wait patiently for the redemption that comes in Christ Jesus. It's time to groan again. That's how the underground was born. Some of you guys know this, some of you don't, but we did a prayer room, 11 p.m. to 1 a.m. every week. And we played music, and we prayed the scriptures. No preaching, no talking. That's that's too much human, too much beasts. Scripture, God, would you do this? We didn't pray for the underground. We prayed for the kingdom to come. We laid on our faces. Scott, come. Come to Idlewild. Here, come over there. Come wherever you want to come. Would you come? And it's time to groan like that. Again. I don't have my whiteboard. No longer legalism. We're not trying to conjure desperation. We're also not trying to pretend like we don't have to do anything and just be in freedom. God will just do whatever he wants. We want to make space for desperation. Spaces. That's what a prayer room is. It doesn't mean God comes if you make a prayer room, but you make a space. Say, God, we can't make us desperate, but we can make space for desperation. We can make space. And I'm telling you right now, all of you in here, We need a hundred spaces like that. We need living rooms and dorm rooms and board rooms to become prayer rooms. You don't need permission. You just need to groan. You don't need the right technique. You just need Jesus. And we need a hundred of them in the city. Gathering weird people together. Say, hey man, you want to come at a weird time at night, 11 p.m.? Yep, I know it's weird. You're going to lose sleep. You're going to have to fast. You're going to have those awkward moments where you're like, I don't really know what we're doing. Exactly. It's time to groan again. I invite you today to come out of Babylon. Come out of the way of the beast. Stop having faith in your flesh. And I invite you to begin to groan again. To make spaces in your lives to groan again. Every morning in front of the Bible, it's not magic, it's just space. God, I read your word. Help me groan. God, I have a worship song playing. God, help me groan. God, we're gathering as a microchurch. Help us groan. I invite you when you come to communion, tell me we'll wrap us up. Come out of Babylon this morning. Repent and begin to groan again.